All right. Hello and welcome to the third lecture. Um, so today we're going to do a, a brief primer on uh, symplectic manifolds. We need that to um, introduce floor theory because it's on symplectic manifolds. And um, yeah, so before I do that, um, last lecture we spent a lot of time motivating floor theory. What does that mean? We spent a lot of time um, constructing, defining Morse homology, which started with the Morse complex. So I can quickly give you a roundup of what we did the last time. So we introduced Morse homology. So we started with um, a Morse function, which is on a manifold X whose critical points we consider, and if all critical points, the complete set, all points in the set are non-degenerate, we call it a Morse function. So a Morse function has all non-degenerate critical points. And using these critical points, we define what is called a Morse complex. So in the last class, I did not denote it with an M. So I uh, intend to denote the floor complex with the C F, F for floor. So I'm, today I'm denoting it by M for Morse, C M, that's a Morse complex. Um, of x and which which is a sequence. So each component in the sequence is generated by critical points of that index. Okay, and there are connecting these components are the differential, and the differential is a Morse differential which counts downward trajectories. And this definition is attained by two steps, which are called transversality and compactness. And then we have a third step, which is called boundary, which helps us uh, show that this is indeed a, a differential, which means that it squares to zero. So this is a chain complex. And so you can compute the homology of this chain complex, and that's going to be the Morse homology of the manifold X. Okay. So as an example, let me quickly recall from yesterday, uh, I have here a deformed sphere, which has two well, four, one, two, three, four critical points. Uh, so I've labeled the critical points with, you know, the, the red dots you see in this picture. And you see uh, next to these red dots, numbers in green, those are indicating the index of these critical points. So you have two local maxima, um, one saddle point and one local minimum. Okay. And we look at we count the differential count. So first of all, we have the components of the complex. So we have um, two copies of Z mod 2 over here because this is in index 2. Okay. And here we have one copy of Z mod 2 because these are complexes generated by critical points over Z mod 2. And one copy over here coming from the minimum. Okay. And so the differential is counting the trajectories. So how many trajectories do you have? You have this orange trajectories, the two trajectories going into, flowing into this saddle point. And so what you get over here is a one and a one because it's a, it's a complex, well, it's a, let's say a, a group of uh, a module or a group uh, of, let's say two rank two going into something that's rank one. And so we have the matrix of this differential it's given by a one one. Okay. And here you have this dot generating this um, degree one component. And from here, from the degree one component into the degree zero component, you have two more trajectories flowing. Yeah, the one that you see in front and there's one that's dripping down at the back. Okay. So you have two of them. And since there are two trajectories, we've counted them, there are two. And we're counting them mod two, of course, because everything is over Z mod two. So you get a zero. And that's why this differential is zero. But this differential is zero uh, because it's just the zero map going to zero. Okay. So now you just compute the homology using these matrices or differentials. You compute kernels, ranks, H at each degree, you get in the degree 0, 1, 0, 2, you get a copy of Z mod 2 and 0 otherwise. Okay, And that's not a surprise because this is yet another homology. 
theory or homology variant and it's supposed to be an invariant of the manifold and uh, if you deform the manifold, so it's a deformed sphere, you deformed it from the usual sphere, it's their, their homologies should match. So that's not a surprise. Okay, so coming back to today's lecture. So this floor theory is an infinite dimensional analog or version of Morse theory. What does that mean? You start with the same thing. You start with something over here. So at this time it's going to be a functional. You will see. You will look at the critical points. You generate a complex out of those critical points. So that functional blah blah define a differential using two properties, uh, transversality and compactness and then show that it's indeed a differential using boundary and then you're able to compute a homology which is going to be floor homology. Okay, So you're going to write it like HF that was HM. This is HF and that's what you get. Okay. All right. So before we do that, so floor theory is done on a symplectic manifold. So I need to tell you what are symplectic manifolds. Again, my references are for an introduction to manifolds, uh, uh, for a general introduction to manifolds. And then we have um, uh, lectures on symplectic geometry by Anna Canis de Silva. Uh, sorry, that's supposed to be an A. Uh, introduction to symplectic homology by Dusa Macduff and Solomon. Uh, Morse theory by John Milner. I apologize for not having this there yesterday. And then we have introduction to Morse theory. So these are the classical approach and here you have something that builds Morse theory or Morse homology to, okay, so I have switched the theory and homology. Apologies for this again. So it's supposed to be Morse homology and floor theory, never mind. Okay, so what are we doing today? So we start with symplectic preliminaries. So what is a symplectic vector space? Okay, so this is hopefully visible to everyone. So this is a pair where you have a vector space with a skew symmetric bilinear non-degenerate map defined on it. So it takes two vectors and gives you a real number. So this omega, because it's non-degenerate, it induces uh, an isomorphism between V and its dual. So you start with a vector and you plug it into one of the arguments of omega and becomes a functional on V and that's, uh, uh, that induces an isomorphism between the two. And this is equivalent to saying that there's a basis. So you have E's and the F's basis vectors of V such that omega E i E j is zero, the same for omega F i F j and blah blah and omega E j Fj is the Kronecker delta uh, Ij. Okay, so um, this comes from the fact that it's skew symmetric, and um, uh, what else? Right. So the the okay. So uh, right. So it. Um, this is equivalent to saying that in this basis, you can write down the matrix of omega like this. This is what it looks like. Okay. So in particular, this means that a symplectic vector space is always even dimensional. Okay. For example, you can look at R to N with omega naught, that's the with symplectic basis E1, the standard basis E1 to E2 N. Uh, you can look at any real vector space and E and you can form this uh, new vector space which is its direct sum with its dual also a symplectic vector space and so once you have a symplectic vector space you can define for a subspace so it's clear what a subspace would be it's a subspace for which uh, when you restrict this omega to the subspace so it's a symplectic vector space in its own right. Okay, so when you restrict this to W, you get uh, a symplectic vector space again. So you have a if you have a subspace, then you can define the symplectic orthogonal. What does that mean? That means all vectors in V which are symplectically orthogonal to vectors in W. Okay, so this means that if you take omega of these two vectors, you'll get zero. 
all right and so the small exercise to show that you can use the non degeneracy to show that the dimensions add up to the dimension of v and that if you take the double uh, do, uh, double orthogonal orthogonal of the orthogonal then you get the same vector space back so a few other definitions so you call a subspace isotropic if omega restricted to the w is identically zero so if you restrict it to w which means you do a w cross w going to r then you just get the zero uh, map and which means that um, this w is always contained inside its orthogonal okay it's a small exercise to check again and it's called coisotropic if the reverse thing holds true that the orthogonal symplectic orthogonal of w is contained inside w okay and it's called a lagrangian subspace if both hold which means that w or its symplectic orthogonal exactly equals w okay and this of course forces the dimension of such a subspace a lagrangian subspace to be exactly half the dimension of v because of this okay all right so that's not what i wanted to uh, do so maybe i can write down what a symplectic manifold is first and then we can come to just a minute yeah complex structures come fairly later so let me start with symplectic manifold so i want to define a symplectic form and a symplectic manifold so i'll keep um, abbreviating symplectic like this i hope you can bear with that um, so omega is a Durham two form on a manifold M. So which basically just means that for every point in M, this there exists a map omega p from the tangent space at M cross the tangent space at M. So it's a two form, it takes up two arguments and maps it to R, which is Q symmetric and bilinear. And this omega, this assignment that takes any P to omega P varies continuously or smoothly varies smoothly with respect to p okay that's what it means so if you take such a two form omega as in part 1 is symplectic It's a symplectic form if omega is closed. What does that mean? That means that its exterior derivative equals zero. Okay. All right. And three uh, symplectic manifold is a pair m omega sorry small omega so that's a manifold and uh, i should say that's a manifold and this is a symplectic form on m so well this uh, you must have uh, guessed already when uh, with this um, at least the part that uh, omega p is is symplectic uh, so the first condition and the second condition they tell you 
that the steepy, the tangent space at every point on M is a symplectic vector space. Yeah. So we already know what um, that means. Okay, so if it's a symplectic vector space, we know that this is even dimensional and that implies that M is also because their, their dimensions are supposed to be the same. So this is also even dimensional. Okay. Um, all right, so a small remark, a useful one, is that if you, for a symplectic manifold or symplectic form, it's a two-formed, remember, if you raise it to the to power, the exterior power n, so that it becomes the top form on m, then, so say m has even dimension to n, then um, this thing is a volume form on M. Okay, and what does that mean? This means that M is um, canonically oriented. Okay, that's just a small remark. In fact, for all the, if this is, um, uh, a volume form, which means it's of course non-vanishing, then um, all the intermediate powers, exterior powers of omega are also uh, non-zero, um, especially if m is compact. And what else? So let me let me give you examples. So m is r to n, and I'm considering omega naught to be dxi wedge dxi. So i goes from one to n. So this is a symplectic. Uh, manifold and with the coordinates uh, x1, x2, xn, y1, y2, yn, those are the two n coordinates on uh, if you write them locally. So in those locally in those coordinates d dx1 at p blah blah d d y n at p form a symplectic basis for TPM. So around a point you are able to write it down, write down this basis. Okay? And so if you have this, you automatically have C n with a, the standard symplectic structure which is given by i over 2 dzk wedge dz zk bar. So, that is just the conjugate of zk and k goes from 1 to n. Okay? And so, this is just a, a transformation or let us say uh, of this under identification of zk with xk plus i y k. So, it just uh, follows from here. Okay. So, maybe I can or maybe I can let it be. So, I will see if I want to erase it later on. So, we can look at other examples. So, look at S2 as the set of all vectors in R3 
of length one and on this you consider omega p so um, so you have this vector p and here you have this two dimensional vector space uh, sorry, two-dimensional plane, which is the tainted space uh, at this point, to S2. Okay, and so this is basically just given by, if you consider the standard inner product on R3, it's given by the orthogonal of uh, subspace of this um, line spanned by um, P, the vector P. So it's and it's uh, the it's induced by the standard inner product. So W P is of any U V is defined to be in a product of P with um, the cross product of or the exterior exterior product of two directions inside the tangent space. So this is the standard because this is already of top. Uh, so the dimension of S two is already a top form. This is a two-dimensional manifold, so it's already a top form. So this is the standard volume form on S two with um, total area because it's a unit sphere. So the total area, if you integrate this, is 4 pi, okay? And that's uh, symplectic uh, also for well, dimensional reasons because if you take its uh, exterior derivative, uh, you get zero for dimensional reasons. Okay, and for, so if you take M, which is any Riemann surface, and omega is a non vanishing so you could take just any non vanishing two form and this gives a symplectic manifold okay again for dimensional reasons uh, if you take the exterior thing of this you get a three form which has to vanish because you have you have a surface which is two dimensional there are no three forms on a surface okay all right so this is an important class of examples we, you remember we are going to talk about this in the context of categories we want to zoom, zone in on this in the next lecture Okay, so there's a way to define, so I've, I've given you what uh, a symplectic manifold is and now I want to say what are the meaningful morphisms between symplectic um, manifolds. So the meaningful morphisms are called symplectic, symplectomorphisms. So this is a map between say m1 omega 1 to m2 omega 2, let's call it phi, such that phi is um, symplectic and uh, it's a diffeomorphism. So I told you this is this invertible map which is also differentiable and symplectic just means that phi preserves the symplectic form. Okay, so a way if you have a map from M1 to M2, a way to uh, let's say have the f have differential forms of these two talk to each other is going to be a pullback. So you take the pullback of uh, omega two, and sh it should equal um, omega one. Okay, so that's what symplectic means, and it should be a diffeomorphism on top of that. Okay, 
So, of course, classifying symplecto, uh, symplectic morph manifolds, you can classify them up to symplectomorphisms, which is, uh, of course, a, a big uh, problem. And, um, but locally, all symplectic manifolds have been classified. And what is the variant? Invariant. So, the only invariant is the dimension of m. Okay. Now, is not that cool? That is called, um, I mean, so let us say it is called the Darboux theorem. So, on any manifold of a given dimension, even dimension, you can um, you can endow it with uh, what you call Darbu coordinates, such that uh, the symplectic form is um, it that, that locally in those coordinates in that chart locally it's symplectomorphic to R two n. Okay, so a patch on a symplectic manifold, a local patch just looks like a patch on R two n, nothing more than that. So, in fact, uh, what is more important in symplectic uh, topology is the dynamics on a manifold, which we do with the help of functions on the manifold and, of course, its subspaces and the geometry that is associated to omega, which is not local, it is a global, it is a form deformed, uh, defined on the entire symplectic manifold. So, there are global invariants that are more uh, interesting and more intrinsic uh, to the manifold rather than uh, local invariance, which is just the dimension. Okay, so let me define subspaces that we want to work with. So, um, a Lagrangian submanifold. of let us say a uh, symplectic manifold m omega is L, which is a uh, submanifold of m with an additional condition such that um, omega restricted to L is 0. Okay, what does that mean? That means that in fact omega p restricted to this the tangent space along the Lagrangian is uh, a 0. Uh, the the bilinear, bilinear form is, is trivial. Okay, that is what it means for all p. Where? In the Lagrangian. So, um, well, this also tells you that according to our definition of uh, Lagrangian subspace of a symplectic vector space. Um, so, you remember we said that if you have a symplectic manifold, then at each point the tangent space becomes a symplectic vector space. So, now if you have a symplectic vector space, because it is come, it is a tangent space of uh, Lagrangian manifold, oh, sorry, it is a symplectic manifold, uh, then you want uh, the subspace, the tangent space to that sub manifold is going to be uh, TPL, you want that to be a Lagrangian subspace for the sub manifold to be a Lagrangian sub manifold. Okay? So, this means that TPL is uh, Lagrangian subspace. Okay, and of course, uh, of dimension which is half of the dimension of TPM, and since this equals the dimension of M, so a Lagrangian submanifold is always of half the dimension of the symplectic manifold. Okay? So, 
just two things to remember. These are, um, if you want to be fancy, you can say these are maximally isotropic subspaces of uh, uh, submanifolds of uh, M, or you can say that it's a half-dimensional submanifold of M, which on which the uh, symplectic form vanishes. Okay, so uh, an important example would be. So, that of um, the cotangent bundle. So, for any just any given manifold, the cotangent bundle gives a, an important class of symplectic manifolds. And inside the cotangent bundle, you can identify a special uh, the image of a, of a section, the zero section. And that's always a Lagrangian subspace. Okay, so let me give you a picture over here, which I can keep for the rest of the lecture. Um, so I'll do that later. Um, example. So I'm looking at M, some manifold no restriction on its dimension or whatever and I am looking at the cotangent bundle. Okay, so, um, you just to, so the cotangent bundle is basically the fibers over this, so it is a bundle over M and the fibers of this bundle over M are the space of one forms on M. Okay, so that is the cotangent bundle. So it's it's in the in classical mechanics. If you're familiar with that, then this is the the uh, the phase space uh, that you call what you call the phase space, where you have uh, a part of coordinates giving you positions and the other half giving you momenta. Okay. So T star M is uh, carries uh, canonical one form, which in, in local coordinates you can write as the, um, gamma, no, lambda can for canonical as xi dx i, and you sum it over 1 to whatever is the dimension of m. Okay. So, um, so what we are talking about are the coordinates here are x1, let us say in a patch of course. So, let me say in a patch you have x1, x uh, whatever is the dimension of m and over this you have coordinates given by x1, x dimension of m, xi 1, xi dimension of m. Okay. So, these are the xi's over here and these are uh, the, uh, these form a basis of the fiber. Yeah. One forms that generate uh, the space of one forms in the fiber. Okay. So, the symplectic form on the cotangent bundle is again the canonical one is given by minus of the exterior derivative of this one form. So, you, this is going to raise the degree to 2. So, you have a one form, you take the exterior derivative, you get a two form, you take the minus of that and that is your canonical symplectic um, uh, form ones. Okay, so um, let's see. So, for example, let's take M to be S one. Okay, so um, so the 
cotangent bundle looks like a cylinder. Okay. And we have this picture. And inside of this, you look at um, the zero section. This is what you call the zero section. This is what this example is about, a Lagrangian. So this is the set of, so let me say coordinate on here is x and let's say coordinate on the fiber is y. So you have x, y inside t star m such that y equals 0, okay, in each fiber. What does that mean? So this is what every fiber looks like. So you just, you see this just keeps, it's, it's, um, it's an infinite cylinder. So each fiber is like R. And so in R you can identify the origin. So that's y equals 0. And you get for, if you do this for every fiber, you get this thing here, which is the zero section. Okay, it's the image of the zero section. All right. So that's a Lagrangian submanifold of um, T star S1. Okay. So maybe we can move on. And I think it's a good point to move on. So I've, I've given you what a symplectic manifold is, and we've discussed what Lagrangian subspaces are, or Lagrangian submanifolds are. And you also have some idea of what a symplectomorphism would be like. Okay, so uh, eventually when we look at some dynamics on the manifold, we're gonna do it via symplectomorphism. So keeping the structure of symplectic structure intact, so that's a meaningful way of moving objects on a symplectic manifold, okay? And uh, you, you get a hang of what I'm saying uh, as we move on, okay? All right, so on a symplectic uh, vector space, you can introduce a complex structure. What does that mean? A complex structure on a symplectic vector space is, well, okay, so before I need to say, so we need to make like a distinction between a complex vector space and what we usually in the usual sense call vector space over C. Okay, so a complex vector space for me is a pair. So V is that set of vectors which satisfies those, you know, long list of axioms and J is an endomorphism which means a self map between V such that it squares to minus of the identity morphism, uh, identity transformation on V. So this is called a, com this J is called a complex structure on V, okay. So uh, this thing can just be identified with the usual, in the usual sense a complex uh, a vector space over C. If you take this J to be multiplication by square root of minus one, okay. You remember that in a vector space over C, you can multiply by square root of minus 1 and the vector still remains inside that vector space, which is not true for a, a vector space over reals. Okay, for instance. All right. So now we come back. So you start with this pair Vj. So you have a space of vectors with and this endomorphism that squares to minus of identity. So you can this complex structure J on a symplectic vector space V omega is omega compatible if omega of J, so it's in some sense, uh, it omega preserves, uh, it's, oh, in some sense omega is preserved when you apply J to both the arguments, okay. So that's, uh, that's the symplectomorphic condition and then you have some sort of positivity which says uh, that omega of u j u is greater than zero. So there's some way of saying that omega this uh, this complex structure that you impose on a symplectic vector space is compatible omega with the symplectic structure of that vector space. Okay. So compa compatible complex structures always exist on symplectic vector spaces and conversely if you start with a complex vector space which means this pair 
there is always a symplectic structure on V such that J will be omega compatible. Okay? So, what is the goal of this? The goal of this is that every symplectic manifold admits a family of compatible almost complex structures is where we want to get at. Okay? Um, all right. So, let me say what it means for uh, a manifold to have an almost complex structure. So, an almost complex structure for short ACS on M is a smooth field of complex structures on tangent spaces. So, tangent spaces are always uh, symplectic spaces, symplectic vector spaces and a complex structure we mean in the sense of what I showed you on the slide, uh, tangent spaces. Okay. So, this means what is what do you mean by field of complex structures? It means that for every point in M to this you can associate a complex structure where on the tangent space at x. So, belongs to endomorphisms of this means it is a map from T x m to T to itself such that what makes it a complex structure is that it squares to minus identity. Okay? So, then m j is called an almost complex manifold. Okay? So, you started out with uh, um, sorry uh, yes, what do I want to say? Uh, yes, you start out with um, hmm. okay, let me say that again. I apologize, I said something wrong. So, let me go over this again. So, an almost complex structure on M, so M is not a symplectic manifold yet, okay. So, it's just a manifold is a smooth field of complex structures on tangent space. So, tangent space is nevertheless a vector space, if not a symplectic vector space, it's still a vector space. So, this makes sense. Okay? And then, uh, so this just makes it a complex vector space according to our definition. So, it is the pair T x m for every x T x m j x. Okay? And so, if you have this, then you call this uh, um, an almost complex manifold. Okay? And now we are going to say we are coming towards that goal which says that every symplectic manifold admits a family of compatible almost complex structures. All right. So, let us talk about eventually we will talk about a symplectic manifold. So, let me quickly give you um, another definition. So, for m omega, so whenever I write this pair, you should know that we are now we are talking about a, a symplectic manifold and almost complex structure j on m is called omega compatible if the assignment G which maps every point in M to G sub x. This is a map from T x M cross T x M tangent space at x to R defined by taking two vectors 
and giving you omega of u j x v. Okay. All right. Is a Riemannian metric on M. Okay. All right. So now you have, um, you could start, you start with the symplectic manifold and you can give it a, a, an almost, an almost complex structure on a symplectic manifold is J which satisfies this. And this is called compatible, omega compatible if this map that takes x to g x called g is gives you a Riemannian metric on m okay so that's what we know and so this side this part of you know symplectic geometry kind of makes a connection between symplectic geometry uh, the geometry of this closed uh, skew symmetric non degenerate two form complex geometry, um, which is geometry of a, of a linear map which squares to minus one, and Riemannian geometry. Okay, so you have um, maybe we can look at this part first. So you have this. So, you have a symplectic form which is bilinear non degenerate skew symmetric. G is Riemannian metric, so it's a positive definite inner product on the tangent spaces. J is an almost complex structure which is an endomorphism or an assignment. Every point you have an endomorphism of the tangent space at that point, it's linear and it squares to minus 1. So, you get a triple which is compatible. Okay? So, you have omega G J. And these are compatible when G of something is omega of that thing and J applied to the other thing is exactly that condition we wrote for the Riemannian metric. Okay. So now answering that question uh, that every symplectic manifold um, admits a family of compatible almost complex structures. So, if you start with a symplectic manifold which is equipped with the Riemannian metric, there exists a canonical almost complex structure on M which is omega compatible and of course, there always exists Riemannian metrics on M. And so, this means that any symplectic manifold has compatible almost complex structures. Okay. All right. So, now we can go to um, something which is, so um, how does the almost complex structure on a manifold uh, relate to the complex structure on that manifold or maybe I should phrase it better, if it is induced by a complex structure is the question. Okay, so an almost complex structure is called integrable if it is induced by a complex manifold structure on M. Okay, so this means by default all complex manifolds are also almost complex manifolds. Okay, um, but the reverse is of course not true unless the almost complex structure is integrable according to this definition. So integrability is the obstruction for an almost complex manifold to be a complex manifold. So, for example, every almost complex structure on a Riemannian surface is integrable. So, all Riemannian surfaces are um, uh, their almost complex structures is, are also complex manifolds, which means that their uh, almost complex structure is induced by the complex structure. S2 is an almost complex manifold um, and a complex manifold. S4 is not an almost complex manifold. S6 is almost complex, but it is unknown whether it is complex or not. This is a very famous problem. S2n for 
so even dimensional spheres, you remember I, in this context everything is even dimensional, for n greater than or equal to 4, which means 8 and higher, are not almost complex. And Kähler manifolds are symplectic manifolds equipped with an integrable plus compatible um, almost complex structure. So this means that Kähler are also complex. So very familiar examples of Kähler manifolds are Cn, um, every complex submanifold of Cn, Cpn, the complex projective space, and every complex projective variety, which is uh, which uh, is embedded inside or the subspace of uh, uh, Cpn, uh, complex tori, com compact Riemann surfaces, and so on and so forth. Okay, so lots of them, lots of familiar examples. So compatible triples. Omega G J link three geometries. I've already said that, and you see this nice picture out of. Um, well, this is not out of uh, Anna's book, but uh, you find a similar <laughs> diagram in Anna's book. It says a smooth, even-dimensional orientable. You see, we started with this, and then inside we have some of them that can be equipped with almost complex structure, and symplectic ones are where that almost complex structure is compact, omega compatible and the complex ones are again a subspace of uh, you know so that's, they are fewer than almost complex okay so there are some for which the almost complex structure is induced by complex that's what lies in this uh, in this rectangle and the ones that where for which it's not induced is lie outside and then Kähler is everything here so this is uh, it's a class which is like overlapping everything. Okay, so that's just to give you an idea how these different um, structures interact. Okay, so we can go back to the board. Um, okay. All right. So hopefully before the break, I can finish this section. Right, so um, what do I want to say? I want to say the following. I've said this before. So every uh, complex um, one-dimensional manifold is a Riemannian surface or a Riemann surface, okay. uh, so which means that it's, it's symplectic, the almost complex structure is integrable and it's com compatible with the symplectic structure and blah, blah. Okay. So um, let's define um, a J holomorphic. So I've already we've, we've already seen that on a com on a uh, uh, um, symplectic manifold, you, they're always you can always you know endow it with an almost complex structure. So J is that almost complex structure. So a J holomorphic curve. This is without boundary. Is a map from U. Oh, u from uh, sigma j, so this is a compact Riemann surface with complex structure given by this small j, and this is a smooth map into this almost complex. Uh, manifold M. Okay, so this is an almost complex manifold. All right, such that du composed with J 
equals j composed with du. Okay, so what this means is that if you rearrange, you get uh, what is called, if you're familiar, um, the d bar operator, and so this means that this d bar of u equals zero. So this is equivalent. So this is called the Cauchy Riemann operator and this is called the Cauchy Riemann equation. So U is a solution of the Cauchy Riemann equation. Okay, makes sense. So that's just rearranging that and you get uh, Okay, so this is a this is a differential equation, if you like, and you solve that to get that u, that function, and uh, the solution is a function which is a mapping from the Riemann surface to this almost complex manifold, and this is what you call a J-holomorphic curve. And why do you call it a J-holomorphic curve? Because it's a, it's a, it's holomorphic, but with respect to an almost complex structure, so it's J-holomorphic. And it's a curve because the image of this thing, which is complex one dimensional inside here, is going to be one dimensional. Okay? So it, the image is going to be a curve. Um, okay. So, for example, if you take, um, so there are, I, I wrote without boundary because there are no conditions on the boundary of uh, this curve, and that will be clear when I show you what a one with the uh, boundary looks like. So if you take uh, sigma to be S2, then this U is called a J holomorphic sphere. And if you take sigma to be D, you'd call it a J holomorphic disk. Okay? So it's complex one dimensional, but it's real two dimensional, and this is what it looks like. Okay, this is what it's called. Okay, I have I, it doesn't look like anything over here. Okay. Um, so these J holomorphic uh, curves are also sometimes called pseudo holomorphic. You remember the holomorphic condition is uh, this d bar of u is zero. Okay, for you to be holomorphic, but you put a j over here because this depends on the j uh, and not the standard uh, complex structure because it's an almost complex uh, manifold. Okay, um, so with these you can define m a j. This is, um, so this M should remind you of the space of trajectories, Morse trajectories uh, from yesterday. And this is something of this sort is eventually what we are going to count in the floor picture also. So you can define this as the moduli space of pseudo holomorphic curves um, representing um, a homology class in M. Okay, so this is going to this uh, this cycle, this class, it lives in H two because it's a, it's something two dimensional real okay so anyways this is very um, hand wavy i don't mean to give you much more detail uh, so maybe i can quickly give you um, so we can come back to more detail later so this is the definition for something that you have with boundary Okay, with Lagrangian boundary conditions. So if you start with a symplectic manifold M and you consider a bunch of Lagrangians, of course you could have two, three, one uh, and lots of them. So I have here k plus one. 
uh, let J be an almost complex structure and U be a smooth map that goes from this pair D its boundary, so it is relative to the boundary and goes into M and the union of these Lagrangians. So, what does that mean? So, when you look at this map, it is clear that D gets mapped to the M and the boundary of the disk somehow gets mapped to the union of Lagrangians. Okay? So, I have all these formulas here that you do not need to look at, but this is this is the same condition that I have written before. So, the complex structure on the disk uh, you know is the standard uh, complex structure given by this square root of i uh, minus 1. And so, it is a similar you know this Cauchy Riemann equation for this almost complex structure j. And then such a u is called a j holomorphic disk with Lagrangian boundary conditions. What does that mean? So, the, these formulas that I have written over here just means that the intersection points get mapped to points on the boundary of the disk, you have these points k plus 1 points that get mapped to the intersections of Lagrangians. Okay? And these arcs between two points, mark points on the boundary of the disk get mapped to the Lagrangian part, part of the Lagrangian between two intersection points. Okay? So, it makes sense you have a you have uh, mark points on the boundary of the disk and each such bit gets mapped to one Lagrangian. Okay? And the, these points get mapped to uh, their intersections. Okay? So, these are if I zoom out again you see this u such that these conditions are fulfilled. Okay? So, these are the Lagrangian uh, these are the Lagrangian boundary conditions. So, this is the case of a uh, holomorphic J holomorphic disk with boundary. Okay? You need to you know how, how the disk's boundary gets mapped and the of course, uh, image of the disk uh, lies in the union of Lagrangians. Okay? All right. So, maybe we can stop here and if there are any questions, you are welcome to ask. Um, otherwise, we take a break. And so, I just have a little bit of something to, to share before we move on to um, floor homology. Okay? All right. So, um, so here is what I want to tell you. So, to do some, you know, to, to be able to move objects, so to do some dynamics on um, a symplectic manifold we need a smooth function on the manifold. And um, so, H is a map from the symplectic manifold M to R. So, the smooth function and d h its der exterior derivative is a one form on M. And since this omega the symplectic form on M is non-degenerate, this implies that there, ha there is a unique vector field we denoted by x sub h such that when you take the interior product of omega or you contract omega with respect to this vector field, you get exactly that one form which is the exterior derivative of that smooth function h. So, what is the interior product just to recall is when you contract a two form it, the two form is supposed to have two arguments, you contract it by a, a vector field, you get one argument less. So, that means it is now this one is only going to take up one argument, it is going to give you uh, a real number. So, this is um, uh, a one form. Okay? And what we are saying is that this one form is exactly d h. Okay? So, when this happens, you can integrate this x h this vector field, you get a one parameter family this is standard of diffeomorphisms of uh, the manifold M generated by x h, which you call flow along that vector field. So, we can denote it by rho t. So, these for every t you have got t is the parameter. So, for every t you have got this diffeomorphism such that the initial one is identity and the, the other ones are, are given by you know flowing along. Uh, this vector field. Okay. So, all of these 
are not just diffeomorphisms, they are in fact simplectomorphisms. Okay, what does that mean? When you pull it back, so since there is omega here and the same omega here, so when you pull back, so the pullback under rho t of omega is the same omega. Okay. So then this xh is called a Hamiltonian vector field and this h is called a Hamiltonian function on m. Okay. So you see the flow of the Hamilton Hamiltonian vector field is given by symplectomorphisms. So when you move on m you move by symplectomorphisms. Okay. You have to go from one point let us say to another point. Uh, you map this point to this other point through a symplectomorphism of m, that is roughly what that means. But I, I think it was better to just say that you flow along the vector field. Okay, for just for an example, we have the height function on S2 with symplectic form given by d theta dh. So, theta is this coordinate, the angle coordinate and height is this vertical um, the coordinate in the vertical direction. So, you have h of theta h, so h of a point on the sphere is given by the height where that point is. Okay? So, for every say point over here you have a section uh, like a, uh, a slice of the sphere and this point uh, yeah, and, and the whole you know 2 pi uh, angles changing, but the h is the same. So, for every you have a height. Okay. So, this has, so your two form looks like d theta wedge uh, d h and if you contract it by x h, this height function, you get d h. Okay. And so, your vector field is along, uh, you rotate along the angle coordinate. Okay? So, this is what it looks like. So, this is a change uh, with respect to theta and the flow is, is just what I said. So, you, you start with, so if you are looking at a slice, you start with a point here. Let us say you start with a point which is the tip of my thumb, that is one angle and you just move that angle by a theta, you have moved the vector. Okay? So, that is the, the point along uh, this, that slice of the sphere. Okay. Um, sorry, I just want to see where I want to go next. Okay. All right. So now we go to the next section, which is floor theory. So, the data, so I have already said that this is supposed to be some sort of an infinite dimensional analog of Morse homology or Morse theory. So, the data that we start with is a compact symplectic manifold. Okay, with some assumption. Okay, so, this is to keep things under control, you will see there is a lot of technical detail in this definition. So, we assume that the second homotopy group of uh, omega is vanishing. So, this is, we make some choices along the way in defining floor theory. So, this makes it independent of the choices, you will see. Okay. So, to this w we associate the pair l w and a h. So, this thing here is a Hamiltonian all your manifold. W. This is, if you like, you can say uh, you identify S1 or you say uh, with R mod Z and you take all smooth maps from this, uh, if you like, S1 into 
w. What does that mean? You are considering loops. Okay? So, you take smooth contractible loops. So, the, the reason you have identified, so these are smooth contractible loops in w. Okay? And so, you see, we do not do Morse theory on the symplectic manifold. Okay? We associate to this something which is infinite dimensional okay? to do an infinite dimensional analog of Morse theory. And instead of the function as in the case of Morse theory, you have a functional on this space. Okay? So, this thing here is a functional null on LW. Okay? That's that's what we're going to do. Okay. So AH of X equals something something. So I'll say what what? So so in Morse we were looking at M and a Morse function on M. Okay? And now in fourth floor, we're looking at this infinite dimensional loop space and a functional. So H is a Hamiltonian on W. So this I forgot to say this H is a Hamiltonian function on the uh, symplectic manifold you started out with. Okay. So. Um, so, you see the analogy, that is the manifold, that is the infinite dimensional space, that is the function and that is a functional on this space. Okay? And now, what did we do over here? We were looking for critical points of this Morse functional and those generated the, those generated the Morse complex. So, we are going to look at a functional for each flavor and floor theory comes in several flavors depends on what you want to do with it. So, each uh, in each flavor you are going to look at some uh, functional on a suitable space associated to a symplectic manifold and then we are going to try and look at critical points of that functional. Okay? So, uh, how you do that is the usual way of doing it in, in calculus of uh, variations. Uh, so, if you if you are interested, you can have a look at, um, uh, for instance, the example of, um, so if you all want to minimize the distance between, um, okay, so you want to find a function which gives you minimum, dist minimum uh, the shortest path between two points then you look at the functional which is the arc length functional and you look at solutions of the associated Euler Lagrange equation. Okay? So, what I am going to write here is a is something similar to that. Okay? So, a h of x, so x is an element of L w, so which means it is a loop in w. Yes, it's the symplectic manifold, and this equals minus integral over d of the pullback under u of omega plus this integral okay. So, this is for any x inside your loop space and any u which is to map the disk into w. Okay. So, this is a choice you have made. So, this is a choice of an extension to the disk of x. Okay, so, x was a loop 
the image of a loop and now we have extended the x to the interior like inside to the whole disk whose boundary was S1, the domain of x and so this is uh, the choice we have made. Okay? And this is what I was saying that you have imposed a condition so that uh, it is independent of this choice. And there is an h that appeared. This h is a map from S1 cross W to R which is a family of Hamiltonians on W, okay, which govern the dynamics on the symplectic manifold um, corresponding to Hamiltonian vector fields x t h, maybe I should say t and h or maybe h comma t, okay, such that W x h t is d of h t for all t. Okay? So, for every t over here you have an h t which is a map from w to r. Okay, complicated, but uh, what I really want you to remember from this is it is very similar, it is like it is really an analog of what we were doing in the Morse picture. You have a space, on that space you have defined a functional, that functional takes uh, the domain is defined on this domain of loops, takes the input a loop and it gives you as an output something which is, um, uh, it is complicated, but it involves the dynamics, uh, Hamiltonians which govern dynamics on the manifold. So, it has closely uh, something to do with the symplectic manifold. Okay? There is not much um, sense that we can make out of this while just looking at it, but we look at examples and maybe another variant. So, this is um, what you call, um, this is the absolute case or the Hamiltonian uh, uh, version. So, one the critical points of A h are the one periodic solutions of the equation d by d t x of t equals h t x t. Okay. So, I mean this is, uh, this is just uh, using uh, calculus of variations. So, it's saying that um, let us say x or um, how should I say. Um, so, d of this thing is this um, functional is 0. So, you solve this equation, what do you get? You get uh, the critical points. Okay? So, this is 0 for any y uh, belonging to um, yeah and well okay so I should say x maybe and yeah it is just repeating what I have written before. So, no point. So, maybe I can just erase this, but so we, what we are trying to do is just find the critical points of this. Okay. So, this is what gives you the critical points. Okay. And next um, these are required as in the case of the Morse picture to be non-degenerate. So, this means that if they are degenerate, whatever that means, you can move them slightly using um, 
uh, Hamiltonian using small perturbation and make them non-degenerate. Okay, so that's something that we can take away from this, and one can naturally associate an index to a critical point called Maslow index. So, it is denoted by mu and it belongs to the set of integers, it is always an integer. Okay. So, uh, if you want to know what this is, it just means that um, maybe I can try and explain with an example. So, I can, yeah, I, I think I can erase this now. So, if you have, um, so for example, if you have S1, that's a Lagrangian inside R2 with the standard, um, standard symplectic form, um, it's one dimensionless uh, and this is an isotropic subspace, maximal isotropic subspace. So, this is Lagrangian inside R2. In fact, uh, it is a nice uh, exercise to check that in the case of any uh, surface, all curves, uh, whether they are loops, embedded as loops or whatever, are going to be uh, Lagrangian because they only have one tangent direction and because omega is skew symmetric, when you restrict it to this only lonely one tangent direction, you get a 0. Okay? So, it is a nice exercise to check. So, you just, so you start here, you have a tangent line, so you look at the tangent line, not the vector, so not putting an arrow on the vector and you move this around. So, over here it makes one turn. Okay? So, if it was oriented, then this would have made half a turn, but it is not oriented, it makes one turn. And so, uh, this turning number of this when you, when you come back to this point is 2. Okay? So, in general, if you start with a loop in uh, uh, so, if you start with a Lagrangian inside let us say R 2 n and you take a loop in the Lagrangian. So, this gives you a loop in of made up of tangent planes or tangent spaces in the Lagrangian Grassmannian of R 2 n. What does that mean? That just means half dimensional subspaces uh, of R 2 n. Um, so, it has a notation, it is called lambda of n. So, for every point on the loop, you have a tangent space. For every point on the loop, you have a tangent space. So, you get a loop of tangent spaces. Okay? And now, you should think of this number, the Maslow number, as, some, as, as, the, as the Gauss map. So, the Gauss map is going to send every t over here to um, this, the, the tangent line at gamma of t to L, all right. And so, mu of um, any loop is has an image inside pi 1 of, so that is a fundamental group of L and that is the fundamental group of the Lagrangian, Grassmannian and R 2 N. So, this is a result you need to be able to say that this is indeed, the image is indeed an, an integer. So, okay. so, the image is given by this turning number, 
Okay, so this uh, the image of mu is basically this this turning number that I showed for this example times uh, uh, z the generator. Okay, so that's uh, but anyway so this is uh, easier to uh, visualize but here maybe not so much uh, but it's a similar way of associate because what you're doing is the the solutions are also inside the loop space okay so essentially it's a loop and you go in some sense you go around the loop and you track some sort of a you, you the tangent spaces also make a loop and you track this turning number it's going to in some sense give you um, uh, the Maslow index of that uh, solution okay that loop the solution is going to have an index okay so you the non degenerate can be arranged using perturbation with by a by a hamiltonian and you can as a way to associate an index okay so we're in a good position to say what the hamiltonian floor complex or the, in the absolute case the floor complex looks like okay the Hamiltonian version or like the absolute case and the other thing that we're going to do is the Lagrangian version uh, or the relative case okay so C F K maybe I should write it on top is generated over Z mod 2 by critical points of this action functional with index exactly equal to k okay that's the k over here and c f star is some of these c f k's k goes from i don't know what to what but okay so this is denoted because it you know all of this depends on a hamiltonian so it's you know you write dependence on h so that's the absolute case okay so i haven't told you what the differential is because the differential involves all those steps so i'd rather do this for the lagrangian case which is of interest to us so but up till now i'm ho i've hope hopefully convinced you that it's really just an infinite dimensional analog of what we did in the Morse picture. Okay. Um, so the relative version is called Lagrangian floor theory. Okay, this is important to us. So the data here is that you take a inside a symplectic manifold, you take Lagrangians, so you like closed symplectic uh, Lagrangian sub manifolds. Okay. And you take pi 2 is again 0 to avoid dependence on a certain choice that we make, like the extension u of x in the previous case. And we also want this relative homotopy group to vanish, okay? Because this is going to involve uh, this definition you'll see is going to involve uh, Lagrangian, um, the Lagrangian somehow, okay? And so, um, for any pair of Lagrangians, L0, L1, satisfying this assumption, so let me put it pi 2 of W, Li is 0, 
so it satisfies these assumptions. Um, we associate a pair delta v or nu. So this delta nu is So there is also a way of uh, having the same functional, uh, uh, but this is uh, the standard, uh, you know, way of doing this is writing it down like this, and I'll show you in a moment. So what is this delta? This delta is again these are these are parts in W, so it's a space of parts. in W. Um, so let's say we have uh, a Z inside here. It's a path from you know a point in W to another point such that the initial point of that path belongs to or lives in one Lagrangian and the second one lives in the other Lagrangian. So if I were to draw a picture, you have two Lagrangians, the blue one and the pink one. So we're talking about such paths, okay? Um, so that's L0, that's L1, okay. This is relatively easier to digest. And now we can look at, um, right, so in the, so this is just a comparison what the what you have in the Lagrangian setup is what I just wrote. You have this delta nu and you look at its zeros, okay? Instead of the critical points, you look at where these vanish. And I'll tell you in a moment what this means. And instead of, uh, instead of writing this omega ALH, so instead of a new space and a functional that depends on L, the Lagrangian as, as, uh, as well as the Hamiltonian and looking at it critical points, we do this, okay? That's what I've written. But you can also do this. So it's a complicated definition again, which is not very insightful. Uh, I mean, not insightful for our purposes. So I'm going to stick to this. And this is just a revision that you had uh, of what we had in the absolute case. We looked at the critical points for this loop space and we had this action functional defined on it and blah blah. So here we look at constant paths. So what is new? Uh, so what are the elements in, in this delta? They are paths from one Lagrangian to the other. Okay. And so if you want to look at the zero of this V that I did not define, let me quickly give you the V. Um, where is my V? Okay. So this V, which depends on, or new, which depends on L0, L0, is defined as minus integral from 0 to 1 of omega x prime t, y, y t, dt. Okay. So we look at the zeros. So instead of critical points, look at zeros of V. So this means you look at constant paths between L0 and L1. What does that mean? You start a point in L0 and you stay at that point. That's the constant path. But then that point has to also belong to L1. So this means we're talking about intersections between these two Lagrangians. So the picture looks like this. So we have all these paths. And the critical points are given by these constant paths where the Lagrangians intersect. Okay. 
All right. Um, so this set is x belonging to your space delta such that minus j, that's the almost complex structure, times x prime of t equals 0. Okay. And such that x1 is this intersection between L and its um, time 1 Hamiltonian deformation um, using this flow of ha the Hamiltonian flow. Okay. So, never mind all that. So, you have these trajectories and you have the critical points right here. Okay, which which you know you can really see and you can imagine uh, really uh, um, they're they're tangible more than what we had in the absolute case. So in the Lagrangian case, we have this nice formulation where you can actually see the critical points of the the functional, which would have had a very very complicated uh, definition otherwise, as really intersections between. Um, the Lagrangians. Okay. So, what is the Lagrangian floor complex? So, I'm going to change this to. So, this thing gets changed to instead of depending on H, it, it depends on the Lagrangians now. So, in the relative case, or the Lagrangian case, So, again, these are critical points, you can assign them. You see here, looking at this turning number is, is easier because now you have tangent spaces that you, you move along the Lagrangian and you look at the turns and stuff like that. So, it is easier to imagine looking at these pictures that, you know, instead of giving a Maslow index to uh, assigning a Maslow index an integer to a loop. Uh, which is the solution of this action functional. Uh, it is a, a critical point of the action function is, is hard to imagine, but this is uh, relatively easier uh, to imagine sometimes. So, C f k of L 0 L 1 is z generated over Z mod 2 by intersection points such that um, this mu of x, the Maslow index is exactly k. Okay, so you have a similar definition. Okay, and the entire complex or the graded module is C f L 0 L 1 is defined as a sum over these k of C f k L 0 L 1. Okay, so the question is, what is the differential? That is the question. So, the differential um, goes from C f k to C f k plus 1. Okay. So, you see this flavor is, is you know, well, all flavors of floor theory are very geometric, but this one is, is uh, also quite uh, intuitively geometric. So, you imagine, one can imagine that this differential should count something. So, instead of counting more downward trajectories, like in the case of a Morse function or the Morse or the pseudo gradient, in this case, it's going to it's going to count trajectories or uh, between intersection points, okay, from one intersection point, which is a critical point, to another, okay. So it's the same thing. It's the same philosophy. It counts trajectories from one critical point to the other. Okay? They just happen to be intersection points in this situation, okay. So let me give you. Um, 
uh, okay. So definition. Um, so gradient trajectories from x to y. So these are intersection points from L0 to L1 in, in between L and N1 are maps U into W that satisfy. So, you see what you have here is, 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 is the surface, right? You have a, a strip, an infinite strip to a surface, a map from a surface to W. Does that ring a bell? It's, it's going to turn out to be a J holomorphic uh, strip because it maps a strip to W, which was your symplectic manifold. Okay, such that this uh, partial U by partial S plus J partial U by partial T equals zero. Okay, so that's again just the uh, Cauchy Riemann uh, equation. Okay, the D bar operator applied to u gives you a 0. So, it is a solution of the Cauchy Riemann equation okay, with boundaries. Yeah. Now, again that should ring a bell. You have a, you have a holomorphic, j holomorphic curve with boundary. This means that part of the boundary lies in one Lagrangian and part of the other part of the uh, boundary lies in the other Lagrangian. Okay. So, you have something like this. You have two critical points between them. So, I will explain this in a moment. What I have written there is a strip. So, you can, uh, okay, anyway. So, this is what you have. So, part of the boundary lies in one Lagrangian and the other part lies in the other Lagrangian. Okay. And there is a way to go from this model to the strip like ends model. So, you have uh, let us say a disc with strip like ends okay? and that is those are this the, because that is the infinite uh, strip like ends. It's a, it's a, you get an infinite strip. Okay? So, that is that the ends are basically the critical points uh, and uh, you view them as, a, as intersections or you can view, view them as anyways. Okay, that is just some uh, so, the way I have written it is an infinite strip. So, which is why I w just wanted to clarify. Okay. Um, all right. So, and uh, the point x goes to one intersection point and y goes to the other. So, let us just randomly pick these and you know I could write equations, but this not going to tell you tell you much more. Okay. So, now you know what a gradient trajectory is, the, is, is in the floor context. So, now you look at the space of all gradient trajectories that m okay? and then you quotient them by reparameterization of what? Of the domain okay? and that gives you the L and now that L has to be of the right dimension. So, that you are able to count that is transversality and compactness and then you want to show that the differential is 0, uh, squares to 0. Okay. So, let me quickly just wrap this up. Um, so, M is the moduli space of solutions. Solutions are what? This equation are the critical points. Uh, sorry, no. Uh, this e just a minute. What am I saying? Yes, that's right. Okay, so it's a, a solutions of this equation. Okay, which gives you this J holomorphic strip which between two intersection points, and this is these are what you want to count. Okay, so you have m x y two intersection points, a Hamiltonian an almost complex structure. These are maps from R cross 0 1 to W. 
so that u satisfy uh, this equation. Let me call it star. All right, and then you have this uh, you have this action of R by reparameterization on this M, just like in the Morse case. So this U S T maps to U of S T plus A or A plus T, okay, and you can quotient M by this action and you get what we call like last time L, but this time it depends on all these things, the intersection points, the Hamiltonian and the almost complex structure. Okay, so you remember the picture. So in the picture last time, we had uh, with a deformed sphere, let us say, in the Morse picture, we had these trajectories, yeah, and you wanted to take a slice, quotient by reparameterization, to just take instead of the whole all points here, because that is what goes into the M, you want just a representative of each. Okay? So, likewise, you quotient by reparameterization to take a representative okay, for all of these. Okay. And so, um, so we want transversality and there is a lot of um, technical detail here, but what this says is that your modular space has to be of the right dimension. So, uh, for this modular space to be a manifold, you need to, um, you know, enlarge, um, um, so, um, well, the Cauchy Riemann operator can be seen as some sort of a section of a, uh, of a, of a bundle over uh, this one parameter family of paths in your symplectic manifold. And, I'm, uh, and so you want to enlarge these spaces, the bundle and the base space, so that you know this becomes a, a, a manifold. So you want to enlarge them to certain Banach manifolds, and so the corresponding uh, Cauchy-Riemann operator, you know, the li linearization has to be surjective. So it boils down to this being surjective, and in fact, transversality just uh, ensures that the dimension of this M, this is important to us, um, equals the difference between the. Uh, Maslow indices of the two intersection points. Okay, this is what is important, and so this should, you know, uh, this is why uh, you know it's a, uh, it's relative because you have uh, this difference when you have consecutive Maslow index critical points, then this difference is one. So you have something that's one dimensional when you take the quotient, you have something that's zero dimensional and the zero dimensional thing when you compactify somehow, you should be able to count. Okay? So that's that's the idea. So there's unfortunately I can't say much about this, but the idea is again to uh, is is really mimicking what you have in the Morse case. You add broken trajectories. Okay, to compactify and finally you have a uh, compactification of this L and so you can uh, then you can you are able to count. And so uh, the case the step of boundary is again takes uh, inspiration from the similar discussion we had for the uh, in the Morse case. So whenever you have two um, uh, solutions 
or two intersection points in this case that are, you know, uh, that have difference of Maslow index equal to two. Um, so you can add to, you know, you can glue more trajectories. So let me say, so if dimension of M is equal to 2, this means that this relative Maslow index is 2, I mean the difference is 2 between the two Maslow indices. Then you add to L these broken trajectories which occur in pairs and so mod 2 you will get uh, 0. Okay? So, which so, let me say it like this because I am not really giving you any detail, occur in pairs and so mod 2 we get a 0. Okay? So, this says that the differential squares to 0, that is the boundary part. Okay? So, now if you, well I have to give you <laughs> the definition. So, if I piece it together, the, the differential is defined by taking x here to uh, this count times y and summed over all y such that the Maslow index of y is one more than the Maslow index of x. Okay, so that is the differential. And what is this? So, this thing over here I can write is um, the number of course mod 2 of points in this compact space L x y h j. Okay? So, it's zero dimensional because this is, this means that m is one dimensional. So, so the quotient is zero dimensional and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, okay. So, just one last definition for the day and then hopefully we can look at an application and then we finish just one moment. So, maybe I can write it down here. So, what is the floor homology or cohomology? This is defined as just the homology of this complex. So, you just take kernels. So, let us say k is kernel of um, dk uh, modulo image of uh, d k minus 1. Okay? This is the usual. Okay. And this is independent of the choice of Hamiltonian um, and you know if you if you perturb um, so if, if you have a small uh, Hamiltonian which means you make small perturbations of floor trajectories they coincide with gradient trajectories of the Morse function. So, you get there is a way to relate the two and so on. I do not have the time to uh, say that, but uh, but anyways, I just I have the definition there. I can show you an application. Um, okay. So, first a quick, quick uh, recollection of what we saw in um, the Morse picture. Um, so, if so, Morse uh, homology is uh, uh, you remember. Uh, um, It's um, it's an invariant, okay. So if you have diffeomorphic manifold, it's going to give you the same. And um, anyways, so it's it's invariant and it's invariant, and there is a way to uh, to um, uh, have a map that goes from the uh, so this is C M the uh, Morse complex to the singular complex on M 
by just mapping uh, every point here, every critical point here to uh, the uh, stable manifold that comes in. So, these you remember these are all trajectories that came into the critical point. Okay? So, you map it to the stable manifold and you remember the stable and unstable manifolds give you a CW decomposition a cellular decomposition of the manifold. Okay? So, that somehow relates to the singular homology blah blah. So, the, you, you know see you see that, the, that these are eventually they turn out to be isomorphic. So, this is just to say that um, if if you if you consider the usual sense the usual homology you know that um, the dimension of the kernel is always the dimension of that graded piece the chain uh, group uh, minus the rank of the linear map yeah so you have something that goes from ci to ci minus 1 that is a linear map, it has an image, a rank and the, the dimension of the kernel would be this thing minus the rank and so the Betty number is dimension of the kernel minus dimension of the image of the previous map and so this is rank of i plus 1 or i minus 1, I might have missed uh, but anyways, you you're getting the point. So this is just the difference between the kernel, dimension of the kernel minus and the dimension of the image of the other map. That's the Betty number. And so you see with this that if you look at all the Morse chain, the dimension or rank of the Morse chain uh, group, then this is of course greater than or equal to uh, it's bounded below by the Betty number. Okay, so these are called Morse inequalities, and this tells you. And in fact, uh, the alternating sum of these CIs, Morse chains, is uh, equal to the alternating sum of the Betty numbers, which is happens to be the Euler characteristic. And that is uh, evidence that this is independent of the choice of Morse function you choose. See, everything started out with a Morse function, but you get something that is invariant. Okay. So, now we are going to use, you know, Similar inequalities and facts exist for floor complex, just like for the Morse complex, and we're going to use that for this quick uh, application. So, so more floor theory solves uh, one case of fall, uh, solves a case of the Lagrangian Arnold uh, conjecture. Okay. And this is, in fact, uh, why floor theory was invented by Andreas Floer in the first place. And this Arnold conjecture is like the fixed point theorem of symplectic geometry. So it gives a lower bound on the number of fixed points of a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. You remember Hamiltonians uh, move things around on a surface, on, on a, a symplectic manifold in terms of. So it it gives a bound on the number of fixed points in terms of the topology of the manifold. Okay? So, you start with this data, you start with a symplectic manifold and a Lagrangian insight and these two, uh, you remember these two restrictions that allow you to um, define floor homology in an independent manner without depending on the initial data and let phi be a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of omega of W, the manifold such that L transversely intersects its image under this flow. Okay? So, if you want a quick look, um, so you remember this was a, a symplectic manifold, this is a Lagrangian inside and uh, the Hamiltonian was the height function, uh, no was not the height function, but you can have you can have something like this that moves this a little bit. So, it makes it so, if I make it like uh, like this, it is not uh, transversal, but if I move it a bit, then it becomes transversely intersects the zero section. So, so phi is a Hamiltonian which moves the Lagrangian so that the image becomes uh, transversal, transversely intersects the Lagrangian. Okay? Then the number of intersection points of L with its isotopy is greater than or equal to 
the sum of dimensions of uh, the homology of the Lagrangian. So, this just follows from Morse type inequalities when you apply them to the floor complex. Okay? So, um, so in fact, Arnold's conjecture has been uh, solved by several people in different um, variants. Um, it was initially initially proved by Andreas Flohr and he basically invented Flohr theory. Okay, so what comes up tomorrow is we are going to finally, we are in a position to define Fukai categories and uh, we are going to look at um, the Fukai category of the surface and uh, yeah, we will just see one concrete example. So that's all for today. Maybe if you have any questions, you're very welcome to ask.